Um, our next speaker that we have is Nicholas Vanderberg. He is an associate professor and HIV researcher here at OSU. Um, so Nick, would you like to introduce yourself and take it away? Sure, thanks. Let me share my screen here. Uh, well, that's kind of getting up and going. First, I just want to say thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, to be part of this. This is really fantastic. The program has been excellent so far. So wonderful presentations from, from my colleagues and friends and, and folks you know, here at Ohio State and in Columbus. And I'll give you a five minute warning um, when, when it, that time comes. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, hopefully I won't ramble too much and there will be time for some questions and comments and things like that, uh, but we'll see. Uh, so my talk today will be on current topics in HIV research. Uh, again, many of the things that I will talk about, you've probably heard from some of the other presenters earlier, especially following after uh, David. Uh, you know, it was a, a wonderful overview of a lot of the trials that are going on here in Ohio and in uh, Columbus specifically. So I can't think about you know, current HIV research and care without thinking about the past. And as you've heard from many other people again today, you know, the, the initial um, diagnoses of folks that were showing up in these clinics, um, we didn't know what HIV was, we didn't know what AIDS was. Uh, these folks were showing up and they had opportunistic infections. So things that your immune system should be able to fight off relatively easily if your immune system's working as it should. Uh, these folks were showing up with with pneumonias and uh, other infections that were leading them to, you know, spend a lot of time in the hospital and eventually um, succumb to these infections. Uh, during the early days, uh, the clinician scientists who were, were helping these folks really made some key observations, and they're still wildly important today. Uh, first, they noticed that these folks were coming in without CD4 positive T cells. Uh, CD4 positive T cells are known as your helper T cells. They kind of coordinate the immune response. They do a lot to kind of um, get your B cells activated and get some of your other cells of the immune system uh, to fight off these infections. So they're kind of, uh, you know, the coordinators of your immune system. They also noticed that these folks were coming in with an extremely active immune system. So even though their CD4 positive T cells were depleted, they still had high levels of other markers of immune activation. So these folks were really trying to fight off these opportunistic infections, but they were kind of fighting with one hand tied behind their backs because their CD4 positive T cells were, were largely gone. So as you all know, uh, HIV and AIDS was a um, huge cause of, of morbidity and mortality in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, and these you know, people weren't coming in uh, dying because their CD4 positive T cells were too low. It was because of these, you know, bacterial and fungal infections that they couldn't fight off um, because their immune systems weren't working very well. Uh, but as you can see in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, AIDS became much less of a, a cause of death here in the United States. And I think there are a couple different reasons why that's likely the case. Uh, you've heard about AZT. Um, AZT is one of the main reasons I would say it was the first, you know, HIV approved uh, anti-HIV drug and it was approved in 1987. Um, AZT was a cancer drug and as, as my colleagues have talked about before, when these folks were coming in, there wasn't really anything to treat them with. So, you know, people started trying these different drugs that may have some sort of uh, effectiveness and AZT actually proved to be pretty effective. Um, and folks were started uh, on antiretroviral therapies and that, that prolonged their lives. Um, I also think of you know, HIV and AIDS and some of my early experiences with it uh, are related to um, Magic Johnson retiring, retiring from basketball in uh, 1991 when he announced that he was HIV positive and he was walking away from, from the sport. I also think of uh, Madonna's Like a Prayer uh, album that came out uh, in the in the late 80s, uh, I actually had this tape, and you know the album itself came with this fact sheet that was talking about HIV and AIDS, uh, and I was pretty young at the time, and I had no idea what what this was, and and it led to some uh, some conversations with my parents uh, about what what are they talking about in this fact sheet about uh, unprotected sex and that sort of thing. Um, so I think the two main things that that I associate with with the change in HIV AIDS was the development and access to antiretroviral therapy and then increasing public awareness 
uh, through things like you know Magic Johnson and Madonna and, and you know the public becoming more aware of, of HIV and AIDS. I won't spend a lot of time with the, uh, the global HIV statistics. I'm sure you've heard that a number of times today. But again, around 40 million people are currently living with HIV um, around the world. Here are some of the cases in Ohio. Again, HIV uh, is still being transmitted here in Ohio. It's still obviously a public health uh, you know, concern. One of the things that is particularly interesting to me about this, and I think, again, it speaks to uh, some of the advances we've had in, in care for people living with HIV, is that over half of the people uh, that are currently diagnosed with HIV are actually over the age of 50. So the HIV positive population is getting older. And that's really a wonderful thing. Again, if you think back to the 80s and 90s where people didn't have many treatment options and you know, if they were being diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, um, you know, their, their lifespans were not expected to, uh, to approach that of people without HIV. Um, here with the advancements in treatment, uh, folks are living longer and, and you know, healthier uh, lifespans. So what are some of the main and current topics that people are thinking about in HIV research and care? Um, first, you know, I like to split it up into um, a few main kind of groups. So first, prevention. So thinking about things like vaccines and pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, both of which you've heard about today. Uh, and then when to start antiretroviral therapy. Uh, when I was actually in grad school and I started doing uh, HIV research, uh, it wasn't uncommon that people were still coming to the clinics, they were still feeling pretty good, uh, and they weren't on antiretroviral therapy. And as long as their CD4 positive T cell counts were in an acceptable range and their immune systems were working pretty well, um, they weren't started on antiretroviral therapy until they, they reached a point where their immune systems were starting to get a little, um, a little less functional, a, less, a little less capable. And then they were put on antiretroviral therapy and their CD4 cells came back and, um, you know, things were, things were good. Um, these days, it seems like as soon as someone's diagnosed with HIV, they're put on antiretroviral therapy. And that has a number of important uh, implications to, uh, to the disease course. Um, how to make antiretroviral therapy more accessible and more effective is, is something that's probably a far bigger conversation than I could possibly have in, in the 20 minutes we have uh, here uh, with this one. Um, but again, it's fixing the global healthcare systems, getting governments, nonprofits, drug companies uh, on board, making antiretroviral therapy more available and getting it to the folks who need it. Um, and then what I specifically think about most uh, with my research is thinking about emerging comorbidities in antiretroviral therapy treated people living with HIV. So there have been several studies that have linked markers of chronic immune activation to uh, morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV. And then finally, uh, everybody wants to know about uh, cure strategies. Uh, and obviously that's something that you know, people are spending a lot of time and effort to, uh, to come up with ways to cure HIV and AIDS. Oops. So just a quick shout out, as uh, David mentioned in the previous talk, uh, there is an AIDS clinical trials group here at Ohio State. Again, it was started in the mid to late eighties and is currently run by Dr. Sue Kovatar. Um, again, the ACTG and the AC ACTN um, is a really wonderful resource to uh, promote uh, HIV research and care. It's uh, you know, really a, a pretty fantastic thing, and I'm, I'm happy to be involved with, with so many wonderful people and trials here um, through the ACTG at Ohio State. So thinking about ending the HIV epidemic in Ohio, uh, there are a number of um, proposals on how to end the HIV epidemic. Uh, and there's some pretty uh, lofty goals that have been put out there, uh, like reducing the number of uh, HIV diagnoses by 75% uh, in 2025, and then by 90% in 2030. Uh, there will be a number of different ways that folks are going to try to get there, um, including potentially vaccine strategies and ramping up testing and ramping up PrEP and ramping up antiretroviral therapy. Uh, access. I won't spend too much time on the HIV vaccine, but as you all know, uh, you know developing a vaccine is pretty complicated. Uh, we've heard about uh, a number of different vaccines that have been rapidly developed for COVID-19, and people keep asking me, you know, why don't we have a vaccine for HIV? 
Um, and really, you know, HIV is a very complicated virus. Um, and there has been a lot of work going into understanding how the immune system responds to HIV uh, and how we can potentially fight it off. Again, HIV infects CD4 positive T cells. So these are kind of key players in your immune response. So figuring out how to protect those cells and keep them from be being infected by HIV um, is really important. Um, Dave mentioned broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, CD4 positive T cells talk to B cells and these B cells, uh, you know, another arm of your immune system, produce these antibodies. Uh, and if we can figure out how to produce enough of these broadly neutralizing antibodies through a vaccine or either or taking these broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, that have been created and putting them into someone, you could potentially prevent HIV from infecting its target cell. Again, there are a number of studies going on around the world looking at how we could potentially prevent HIV through a vaccination. Some of the new technologies, you know, with the mRNA vaccines, as Dr. Quick mentioned earlier, uh, could be really interesting. And maybe, you know, the things that we've learned in the past year from uh, developing vaccines for COVID could come back to help us with developing new vaccines for things like HIV. Here I'm showing some slides from a clinical trial that was run through the AIDS clinical trials group uh, a number of years ago. Basically, this was an antiretroviral therapy treatment trial. So the details of which are not really important, but we took folks that were not on antiretroviral therapy and gave them a combination of three different drugs and then tested their blood over the course of a year. Uh, at the early time points, folks were coming in at baseline when they initiated antiretroviral therapy, and then two days later, and seven days later, and 14 days later, so we could get a really close time frame of the viral dynamics and the immune system dynamics of folks that were initiating antiretroviral therapy. And what you can see over here in this panel is that the viral load, so the amount of HIV that we could detect in their blood, came down very rapidly. And by the end of a month, pretty much everybody had undetectable uh, viral loads, so there wasn't uh, detectable HIV circulating around in their blood, uh, and that was maintained over the course of a year. So antiretroviral therapy, again, is, is becoming very effective, uh, and all the time it's becoming more and more uh, tolerable, and there are new combinations that are being developed. You can also see in this study that CD4 positive T cells started to rebound once we started people on antiretroviral therapy. And this is exactly what you would want and what you would expect. So if you can block HIV and prevent it from infecting new cells, you would hope that those CD4 positive T cell numbers would start to come back and they would approach what they would have been pre-HIV infection. And that's, you know, that's really the goal is keeping somebody's immune system, uh, you know, functional and, and really working well. I won't spend a lot of time on you know, the actual dynamics of HIV and, and the life cycle of HIV, but there's been a number of different studies uh, over the years looking at how HIV infects the cell, how it copies itself, and how it makes new viruses. And what we've been able to do with all of that information is come up with multiple different drug targets that can block HIV and block its replication and hopefully you know, prevent its infection of new cells and potentially transmission to uh, to other people. Again, as many people have already mentioned, uh, antiretroviral therapy is getting better and better. There are drugs with fewer side effects. There are combinations that require fewer pills. So instead of taking, you know, three pills, maybe you can, can get away with taking two, or maybe you can get, you know, a, a one pill regimen that has, has the drugs that, that you need to prevent HIV replication. As David mentioned, there are long acting drugs so potentially injectable drugs or, you know, potentially oral drugs that you may only have to take once, you know, a month or once every couple of months that can prevent uh, HIV replication. Uh, and as has been mentioned previously, uh, there are a lot of studies looking at PrEP. So pre-exposure prophylaxis, you know, how can we prevent infection of uh, folks that aren't uh, currently uh, living with HIV um, to, again, prevent the spread and, and you know, help uh, you know, limit the, the new number of infections and diagnoses uh, around the world. Uh, I'm just showing a study over here on the right-hand side uh, that was carried out at Ohio State, uh, comparing a, one of the older versions of antiretroviral therapy uh, to a newer version and looking at some of the dynamics of, of the virus and looking at some of the dynamics of the immune system. Uh, so again, those are kind of the, the main goals of new antiretroviral therapy is, can you have a drug that's more effective 
uh, at preventing uh, viral replication and enhancing the immune response uh, following uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy. We've heard this a number of times, U equals U. So uh, undetectable is untransmissible. So if someone is taking their antiretroviral therapy um, you know, as, as well as they can, uh, and their viral loads are under the, um, the, the detectable levels, uh, it becomes very difficult and basically impossible to transmit HIV to, to someone else. So early treatment with antiretroviral therapy is really um, a key. As I mentioned before, uh, previously people would wait as long as they could because they didn't really want to take uh, a bunch of pills or they didn't like the side effects of some of the uh, older antiretroviral therapies. Um, but we found that if you start antiretroviral therapy while the immune system is still uh, pretty much intact, uh, the outcomes are, are very good. If you wait until someone has um, a very low CD4 positive T cell count, uh, the risk of opportunistic infection increases, the risk of all sorts of different um, comorbidities uh, are also increased. Uh, there was a study that came out a couple years ago looking at very acutely infected folks uh, who were starting antiretroviral therapy. And even when antiretroviral therapy is started as basically as quickly as, as possible, uh, there still seems to be this persistent immune activation that occurs in people living with HIV. So even though antiretroviral therapy uh, was started before CD4 positive T cells were depleted to, to dramatic numbers, uh, the immune system is still being activated in a way that causes chronic inflammation and immune activation. So as I mentioned before, um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about uh, comorbidities in people with HIV. Um, a number of different morbidity uh, comorbidities have been found to be increased in people with HIV, including things like cardiovascular disease and certain types of cancer. Um, and many of these things have uh, underlying inflammatory processes that potentially drive this increased risk. Some of the markers that have been associated with increased morbidity and mortality in people with HIV um, are inflammatory cytokines. So things like IL-6, and you'll hear me talk about that for a moment later. Um, you know, so these immune activation processes and these, these chronic inflammatory processes that seem to happen in people with HIV, even when they have antiretroviral, successful antiretroviral therapy, seem to be related to this increase in um, multimorbidity. Uh, so what's driving this chronic immune activation in people with HIV? We've looked at a number of different things and identified several different possibilities. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but things like low-level HIV replication or changes in um, lipid profiles and metabolic syndrome, uh, potentially co-pathogens like cytomegalovirus or um, other, other viral infections that could, could be um, prevalent in, in the population. Uh, there have been a number of clinical trials that have gone on to try to prevent many of these uh, potential drivers of immune activation in people with HIV, and some of them have worked relatively well, and some of them have not. And again, it's going to be a complicated situation trying to come up with ways to, um, to modulate the immune system without having uh, profound negative effects. So a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about how to best intervene on this chronic inflammatory state in people with HIV. Uh, and they like to think about it you know, as a tree. And I borrowed this slide from uh, Peter Hunt, who's a friend who works out at uh, University of California, San Francisco. Should we be intervening at things like you know, an HIV reservoir or co-infections or something like that? Or do we need to be intervening more directly on the immune cells who are activated in um, chronic HIV? Or should we be active or actively working on some of the comorbidities? So things like frailty or cardiovascular disease. You know, where do you design the intervention to have the biggest impact on um, people with HIV? And what if it's not just a regular old tree like this? What if it's a banyan tree where there are multiple trunks and multiple different branches that could be contributing to um, morbidity and mortality in this population? Uh, I actually added this slide uh, while David was talking because he was talking about uh, monoclonal antibodies and how they're used in different uh, um, different studies to block inflammation and potentially block infection. Um, this was a study of tocilizumab, which blocks uh, the receptor for IL-6. And again, IL-6 is one of those inflammatory cytokines that has been linked to morbidity and mortality in people with HIV. 
Uh, so we gave people tocilizumab and then looked at changes in their inflammatory biomarkers. And again, many of these biomarkers predict morbidity and mortality. So what you can see at the top is C-reactive protein, which is another protein that's been associated with morbidity and mortality. It's this you know, acute phase inflammatory protein. Uh, when we give people tocilizumab, shown here in pink, it drops levels of these immune activation markers pretty significantly. And as you would probably predict, if you're gonna block the receptor for something, levels of that, that protein are gonna be higher in the blood. So this is actually showing that what we wanted to do, it was actually working. So if you can block the receptor for IL-6, IL-6 levels are gonna increase in the blood, but some of the downstream consequences of IL-6 binding to its receptor and promoting inflammation were actually shut down. We looked at a number of other different markers and uh, it looked pretty successful that, that many inflammatory markers were being decreased by blocking IL-6 and its activity. Uh, not all of them were being blocked, uh, but many of them. So, you know, it was a, an interesting study, uh, you know, proof of concept, again, using these monoclonal antibodies to a potential target that may be linked to uh, driving HIV comorbid conditions. We've also taken a different approach where we were giving uh, people with HIV statins. Uh, as you know, statins uh, are typically used to lower levels in people. And we were giving um, people with HIV either a statin, shown here in red, or a placebo, shown in blue. And we found that giving folks statins uh, not only lowered their lipid levels, but also had some immune modulatory effects. So it decreased some of the inflammatory markers that we were interested in, some of the um, you know, immune cells that we care about seem to be less angry and less inflamed. Um, and potentially, you know, that could contribute to lower cardiovascular disease risk in this population. Um, as I mentioned, folks with HIV are, are thought to be at about a twofold greater risk of having um, a cardiovascular event compared to um, demographically similar um, people without HIV. And there was also a very large trial that just, I think, just finished enrollment uh, called Reprieve that's actually looking at giving folks statins and actually counting up the number of heart attacks they could potentially prevent by giving people statins. So again, it's this basic research going to small clinical trials, going to large clinical trials that get implemented at places like the ACPG that really start to you know, generate new and interesting uh, observations and targets for therapy that potentially could be used as David mentioned standards of care that could improve the, the health spans of people with HIV. And that's something that's really important, um, thinking about these kinds of things and, and understanding the mechanisms uh, that contribute to uh, comorbidities in people with HIV. And I'll finish here with just, a, a, again, a brief mention of CURE. Um, and Timothy Ray Brown, uh, you know, formerly known as the Berlin patient, um, who you know, had HIV and was cured of it uh, through stem cell transplantation with, uh, with a certain type of um, stem cell that had a, a deletion in CCR5, so one of the co-receptors that HIV needs to infect cells. Um, again, I think this was mentioned earlier that you know, doing stem cell transplants for the 40 million people that are, that are currently living with HIV is going to be uh, unbelievably difficult and expensive, and, and that's not going to happen. But I think the main thing to take away from this, uh, this study and from, from Timothy himself is that it gave a lot of people hope and gave people you know, reason to believe that you could come up with something that may be able to cure HIV. Um, again, treatment strategies currently with antiretroviral therapy are highly effective in, in doing really good things. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be you know, pushing for a cure and trying to understand how we can, uh, how we can cure um, HIV and, and eradicate it from people that are currently living with it. Um, unfortunately, Timothy Ray Brown passed away a few months ago, uh, but again, he was a very inspiring person uh, that I got to meet on a few different occasions, uh, and he did a lot for, uh, for advancing cure research and, and advocacy, so I just wanted to make that mention here. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all the wonderful people that I work with, you know, here at Ohio State and, and outside um, that contribute to, to so much work and, and uh, again, our evolving understanding of, of HIV, its treatment, um, and how to enhance the, uh, the health spans of folks um, currently with HIV. So with that, I'll end up, stop sharing my slides, and uh, take any questions if we have some time. Wonderful. We have about six minutes left here, and we have one question from Katie Lemmer. 
Yeah, so um, I do have a question about um, funding for this research. So I imagine it's pretty expensive. So where, like, what are the funding sources? Is it like private donors or government? And then, or like whatever. And then kind of how do the sources of the funding affect what you can and can't do in research? Wonderful question. And I, I probably should have been even more clear about it. I, I had a notice on the on the first slide that says I've done some consulting work for a pharmaceutical company, uh, Gilead. Um, so to back up for one second, much of the, the funding that is uh, currently involved in HIV research comes from places like the NIH or uh, foundations like AMFAR or, or others that, that fund um, either clinical trials or basic science research, you know, things like I do in my lab. Um, I have some grants from the NIH. Uh, I also have done some contract work for pharmaceutical companies where they will, um, you know, engage with my lab to, to run some of these studies to measure these biomarkers or measure the virus or, or whatever it is they're kind of interested in. Um, and they'll basically pay my lab to do those experiments um, and, and pay for the reagents and that sort of thing. Um, I've actually had uh, some good relationships and, and good experiences with, with pharmaceutical companies. I know uh, other folks have not had good experiences and potentially um, you would think that maybe a pharmaceutical company wouldn't want you to publish the data if it didn't support that their new fancy drug was, was better and fancier than the old drugs so they could charge more money. Um, that hasn't been my experience. Uh, they basically let me do my work and they don't tell me which, which samples are from, you know, let's say drug A versus drug B. Um, and then the data kind of speak for themselves, um, which is how science should be, right? I mean, it shouldn't be uh, driven by the funders and, and the results shouldn't be uh, hidden by, by people who have uh, different agendas and that sort of thing. Um, so again, you know, hopefully, hopefully you know, that's, that's something we're always working on, right? Is transparency in science and you know, publishing negative results and uh, making sure that, that the information is, is out there and accessible to, to folks who need it. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Another question that we have was that, um, so they say, I know that some people are born with a mutation that makes them naturally resistant to HIV acquisition. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I know that kind of has a little bit to do with um, the Berlin patient. Yeah, so so Delta 32 uh, is the mutation that you're talking about. And I think it's it's found in, I want to say around 10% of kind of folks of Northern European descent. And it has something to do with the, the plague. So folks that survive the plague may have an enrichment for this mutation. Um, and basically by knocking out CCR5, this protein that HIV uses to infect cells, um, it makes someone virtually uninfectable uh, by the virus, which is really kind of interesting. Um, now we've tried to come up with different ways to do this. So, you know, Again, with a Berlin patient, it was a, a stem cell transplant with cells from someone who had this mutation. I'm sure there's work that's going on right now using things like CRISPR to try to knock out that gene in people. Um, but there's also been a number of studies looking at uh, pharmacological inhibition of that receptor. So things like Mirabarak is a drug that binds to CCR5 and is thought to prevent HIV from being able to bind to its target and infect the cell. Um, but HIV is really sneaky and has a high mutation rate and sometimes has actually developed a way to bind to Mirabarak bound CCR5 and still infect cells. So combination antiretroviral therapy is really, really kind of key to, to prevent HIV from sneaking around, you know, even the best things that we can come up with. Um, you know, HIV seems to be one step ahead because of its high replication rate and high mutation rate. So interesting. Um, is there any like potential side effect for blocking like CCR5? Like are people more susceptible to anything or are they mostly just doing good living their life? So I think I think the folks that just have Delta 32 mutations um, typically may have some uh, increased risk for certain bacterial infections and things. So CCR5 usually is a, a protein that's involved in getting your immune cells to move to certain tissues in response to an infection. So you would imagine if somebody didn't have that receptor, maybe their cells wouldn't migrate as well as they should to, to sites of infection, but there's always redundancy in the immune system too. So, you know, just because you don't have this protein doesn't mean all of your cells can't potentially move where they want to. So um, HIV is complex, but so is the immune system. 
so interesting. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, Katie, um, would you like to introduce our next speaker?